do the pressures of being a publicly owned company affect the culture of that business? This podcast is brought to you by ArcMed, fast and focused design and manufacturing. I'm Greg Maurer, founder and owner of ArcMed. And I'm Caroline Squatrigo, talent engagement specialist. We are on a journey to grow, learn, and gain expertise in small to mid-sized company culture. Join us. All right, Caroline, what's the question of the day? So I'm excited, Greg. Um, Today we're kicking off another series. So over the next few episodes, we're going to talk about the impact of different ownership structures on culture. So this first episode focuses on public companies. And public companies definitely have some unique pressures to perform favorably. So I'm curious to see how that translates into cultural expectations. We will start off with a story from our shipping coordinator, Katie Havens. So prior to working for Archimed, Katie spent some time with a public company. So she'll have that boots on the ground employee perspective that we love to hear. Then we will be joined by our guest, Jeff Smolian. Jeff is the founder and CEO of MS Communications. Yeah, that'll be really interesting because Jeff uh, had a private company and then a public company and then just recently, um, in the last couple of days, um, made an offer to, to buy back some shares, not to take it private necessarily, but it's, it's just a dynamic situation there. So it'll be fun to hear his perspective. I can't wait. Well, today um, we have a very special guest with us. I'm sitting here with Archimed's shipping coordinator, Katie. And Katie has a bit of experience um, working for a public company. So prior to Working for Archimed, Katie actually worked for a much bigger publicly traded company, and I'm really excited to hear her experience and kind of the difference between working for for a larger public company and and now working for Archimed, which is privately owned. So Katie, welcome. Hi. I'm so glad to have you. Glad to be here. Well, Katie, tell me a little bit about your past experience. So before, like I said, before you worked at Archimed, you worked for a public company. What was that like? Well, at first it was really good. I was there for about five years and then they got bought out. So the original company treated everybody like family in a way. It was a very big company though, but they cared about the customers. They cared about their employees. They were just more outgoing. So, so what changed when, when they got bought? The new company was more concerned with numbers and not really caring about if the customer was happy or the employees were happy. They overworked us and didn't really care about our safety or well-being. It just ended up being very stressful and very unhealthy. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like you know, I certainly don't want to like just be anti-public company because I think the the original company, right, like they were good. public too. Yes, they were. Yeah, so you kind of got to experience like a full spectrum of like it can be it can be all different types of culture. It just happens to be publicly owned. Yes. Yeah. Well, great. And I mean, I'm just curious, how do you feel like it compares to working for Archimag, which is a bit smaller and and privately owned? It's completely different. Yeah. Um. It's not stressful. It's more relaxed. Everybody gets along. It's like a big family and everybody cares. Well, that makes me happy to hear. (laughs) I appreciate the feedback. Anything we could be doing better? Bigger building. You have a bigger building? Yeah. All right, we'll work on that. (laughs) I think that might be in the cards. So we'll, we'll work on that. Well, Katie, thank you so much. Um, I'm glad we're able to hear from you. And I think it's important to have that perspective of someone who's been like right in the middle of of that type of company and just see what it's really like for like an everyday person working there. 
Next, we will be talking to Jeff Smolian, who has been kind of on the flip side of this. He um, he was an owner who got to take his his company public. So I'm excited to see what he has to say and and how he approaches this from a leadership standpoint. Okay, well, today we have uh, Jeff Smolian joining us to talk about culture as it relates to various ownership structures. This is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, Jeff serves as chairman of the board of MS Communications Corporation, which is based here in Indianapolis, and it's a diversified media company. I've known Jeff for a very long time, uh, I'd say over 40 years. Uh, Jeff lives and breathes broadcasting and is a devoted civic leader, and I admire that very much. He is a former director of the National Association of Broadcasters, former chair of the Radio Advertising Bureau, past chair of the Central Indiana Corporate Partnership, and a member of a number of civic boards and committees. And uh, this is, I always thought this was really interesting and maybe we can get into how you got into baseball, but as a principal shareholder, Jeff led a group that purchased the Seattle Mariners in 1989. Uh, Jeff is um, devoted to company culture. Uh, in fact, Emmis was named one of Fortune Magazine's 100 best companies to work for due to its vibrant collaborative culture. And I think that's a great segue into our session today. Hey, Jeff, thanks for coming on the podcast today. Greg, my pleasure. This will be fun. So as uh, maybe the intro indicated, you've had a very accomplished career in broadcasting and also in baseball. Maybe you could uh, talk to us a little bit about your journey. Well, it's been it, it, it's been fun. As a matter of fact, at the behest of my uh, youngest daughter, um, who I would drive to school every day, she'd say, Dad, you got to write these stories down. We talk about life and lessons and values and so I ended up writing a, a book, uh, getting it, it, working with a publisher now. I guess it'll come out. Um, but I titled it Never Ride a Roller Coaster Upside Down. Because when, you, when you're when you an entrepreneur, you you see all sides of life. And we certainly have. Um, and it really is. It's a, it's a wonderful journey. Uh, but it's not a straight line to the top. Uh, we've done everything you can imagine from Major League Baseball to dynamic pricing to sound masking to radio to TV to international radio, to research, um, and it, we, we've done all sorts of things like that and just had a lot of fun. We were even nationalized in Hungary. I promise you I'm the only person you ever interview who's been nationalized in a foreign country. So we've seen about everything. That's too interesting to let go without diving in a little deeper. What happened in Hungary? We, we won a national tender. It stemmed from when I was the United States ambassador to the International Telecommunications Union. And this was in the early 90s. And um, we realized that at the end of the Iron Curtain that um, media would be privatized in Eastern Europe. And so we bid for a tender in Hungary. We won a national license. There were two of them. Uh, the, the network was a spectacular success. Um, we held it for 12 years. It reached, it became the number one network in the country. I always laughed. Every time I'd beat a prime minister, they'd say, you know, I listen to your morning guys every day. I think our audience out of a country of 10 million was about 5 million. It was a great success. And then lo and behold, a guy named Victor Orban came in. Um, I didn't realize until many years later that Victor Orban was, was Vladimir Putin's first acolyte uh, in, in Eastern Europe. And he really developed the Putin playbook, which is go to businesses and say, give me half your business uh, uh, or you're out of business. And we sort of laughed at all that, but the reality was he took over the country. And if you follow Eastern European politics, Orban is, is, is pretty much of a rogue. Uh, one of my favorite stories was when all this was happening, I called my friend Bill Kennard, who had just been named U.S. ambassador to the European Union. And Bill had been former chairman of the FCC. And I called Bill and I said, Bill, we're being nationalized in Hungary. He said, Jeff, you can't be nationalized in Hungary. They're a member of the European Union. They can't do that. I said, Bill, trust me, we're being nationalized in Hungary. He said, Jeff, I'm telling you, it's not happening. About a week later, Bill called me back and he said, I'll be damned. They're nationalizing you. I said, yeah, Bill, I got that part. Um, so it was a harrowing experience. Uh, we, we were, we got, actually, Mike Pence, uh, when he was congressman, got a resolution in Congress condemning it. I think we had 385 votes. A number of European Union countries um, protested it. But it was really the start of sort of the Viktor Orban regime. Uh, later, he took over the rest of media. 
uh, the judicial system, the political system. Uh, we had the, the great fortune to be his first um, really escapade into uh, taking over media. Yeah, that's uh, it's a scary situation. I followed a little bit uh, about yeah. sort of the death of democracy in Eastern Europe. So how did you get into broadcasting in the very beginning? Always loved it. Um, I was I w- radio was always my hobby. Uh, I grew up as a little kid listening to rock and roll radio and baseball games. I'm, my generation of the people who put transistor radios under their pillows at night and listen to ball games uh, or rock and roll. It was my hobby. Um, I was a history and telecom major at USC. I was going to get a master's at Stanford in telecom. And somebody said, you know, if you really, in those days, nobody said get an MBA. But it was like, if, you know, if you want to be an entrepreneur, go to law school. So I, I went to law school at USC, got my, uh, it's, it's specialized in broadcast uh, law, wrote my law review article on the FCC, um, and then and then you know, came back, uh, involved in a small station, and then started my company in 1980, 40 years ago, 41 years ago. It, it sounds like you have just... I mean, certainly a lot of great experiences, um, and I, I can only imagine those helped shape your view on, on company culture. Um, can you give us, you know, just, just a high-level overview of what your cultural philosophy is and maybe share a story that really helped to shape that? Well, I think it's always been be good to your people. Uh, I've always felt that you have to get your people involved in the ideas of the company. It is a very collaborative company. I am very proud that um, um, my my people have no problem walking into my office, and if they think my ideas are stupid, they'll say your ideas are stupid. Um, there's a, a famous story in our industry when we started All Sports Radio, and and uh, one of my favorite lines is the line between being a genius and an idiot is very fine, and I've been on both sides. When we started All Sports Radio, it was an idea I wanted to do. We had a manager's meeting and it got it voted down. And my dear friend, Steve Crane came in afterward and said, what do you want to do? I said, we can't do this. You can't lead where others won't follow. Um, Lo and behold, a couple of my senior managers said, we feel sorry for you. We still think it's a stupid idea, but we're really doing well in everything else we do. So let's try this idea. And we put all sports radio on the air um, and it was a disaster. Uh, My friend, Jim Lampley, was one of our first air people. And Jim said, this is the Vietnam War of Emmis. And it was a disaster for about a year and a half. And then we bought the NBC stations. We put Don Imus on. And then WFAN became uh, one of the most successful stations in in America. Uh, And now there are 500 all sports radio stations. So every year there are anthologies, uh, documentaries, books written about the start of sports radio. And I always say, I went from idiot to genius in that project, Um, but it was all a collaboration of great people. And then I always say, then I went from genius to idiot on the Mariners project, because when we bought the team, I I was a hero to save the team. And then when they thought we might move it to Tampa, I went to idiot. So that's that's what life is. But but to your question, the key is having a group of people um, who respect one another, who trust one another, and making sure uh, that their voices are heard and that, that everybody in the company has to say in its future. And that's that's the key. We, we I wrote the Ten Commandments very early on about Emmis. Uh, never jeopardize your integrity. Have fun. Uh, be rational. Look at all your options. Get your people involved. Uh, treat your customers well. And so those were all the things that we um, that we did. And I'm very proud of the culture here. It's it's what's allowed us to survive. When I talk about a roller coaster, when the whether it's a pandemic or whether it's a, a, a monumental decline in uh, uh, the economy. When, when things get bad, it's having great people who come together uh, to find solutions. I love that idea that, that culture is not just the right thing to do, but it also allows you to survive difficult times. Yeah, I, um, I think, yeah, go ahead, Greg. Well, I was thinking about how much grit you guys must have had, you know, all sports radio out of the gate a failure, as, as you right. just mentioned, or in your own words. And then it took 18 months yeah. for it to turn. 
Yeah. And during that that eighteen month period, what what was the group like? What, what what was the discussion like? The group was great. The group was as they always are. That one was called Smullyan's Folly. Uh, of all the ideas, that was the one that I sort of owned. So the needling was nonstop. Uh, at, at six o'clock, it was like, uh, yeah, at six o'clock, we lost another $21,000 at band today. Um, <laughs> that's what makes us uh, unique. Um, you know, we've always been able to kid and laugh. Uh, we, I've always said we had the staying power to make fan work. Uh, so we stayed with it and it turned around. And then, and then I, then I used to laugh and tease and say, you know, it looks like I am a genius because this thing worked. But it, it, it's it's a group of people that have always never taken themselves too seriously. I think the key to our culture, too, is we're smart enough to know what we don't know. So whether it's baseball or research or dynamic pricing or sound masking or going from radio to television or international radio, we've always been able to bring people in um, who could fill in gaps for us. And we've always been able to attract great people because it's a culture that I think people enjoy. So we, when you started your company, you really had the ability to, to shape culture. Right. And then you went public. Right. And when you went public, uh, did you think about uh, what kind of implications uh, a public company structure would have on culture? Yeah. And we, we've been able, we've probably been very fortunate, probably why we're such a failure as a public company. Uh, although, again, as a public company, we went public at 15, went to $124 a share, split two for one. When the economy tanked, it dropped to 30 cents. Uh, then it came back. Um, we really we really have done things the same way. Uh, being a public company, I learned early on. I gave a speech at an early conference, uh, and I talked about the, the long-term nature of the investment and, and how we hope people would stay with us. And here was a five-year idea and a 10-year idea. And one of the largest funds in America came up to me afterwards and said, Jeff, I thought that was really nice, but let me tell you something. The people who buy your stock are buying your stock in 90-day increments. And if you make them money in those 90 days, they're happy. And frankly, if you do things in those 90 days that will cause your company to implode on the 91st day or the world to implode on the 91st day, they don't really care. They base their, their bonuses are based on how that stock performs in a short period. And I think it really, that that interaction taught me more about the nature of being a public company. Um, and we've just said, look, we're gonna do the things we think that make sense. Um, we stayed in an industry that we loved, even though the industry was in decline. Uh, we did finally transition out of it, um, but but we've been able to sort of manage the challenge of the public company. Uh, and, and I've also seen when everybody loves your industry, you know, we used to say that, uh, you know, bankers and, and, and stock analysts were like groupies. And then one day they all went away. And then and then now there's nobody that's left, you know, who really cares about the space. Yeah. It, it sounds like you as a leader um, really own your failures. You talk about you, you kind of took responsibility um, when all sports radio came out and flopped. Yeah. Um, and we've talked about that a lot in the podcast, the impact of um, people feeling open enough to fail and, and safe enough to fail. Um, yeah. Would you say that goes across the entire company? And I also wonder, like, do you think some of your best successes would have come out if you weren't um, if you weren't not scared of failure? You are absolutely right, Caroline. Um, we have always said, uh, number one, when you succeed, your team succeeds. When you fail, you take the blame. Um we have always recognized that if you can if you can admit your mistakes and this is really where leadership does matter if the ceo can get up in front of a group of people and say guys i screwed this up it empowers everybody to say they screwed it up when the ceo says not my fault everybody else says not my fault and that really brings politics into a company um i'm a big believer that i don't really you know, matter that much. But in this one, I do because I set the tone and I want people to say, hey, you're free to failure, fail here. And we and we all live with our mistakes. Um, one of my favorite people, my first employee is a guy named Rick Cummings. Rick has headed our programming forever and ever since day one. And, and a couple of things. Rick has 
created more winning radio stations probably than anybody. He invented modern hip hop radio. He really, he really got the credit uh, for making WFAN work and so many other things. And in his office, he has the he has two little mini billboards of two stations that were our biggest failures. And he said, somebody came in and said, why are they there? You've had all these successes. He says, because it reminds me. It reminds me, uh, you know, it keeps me humble. We had one radio station we put on the air in Los Angeles uh, with Rick Dees. Uh, Rick Dees had been a legendary disc jockey, very famous. Uh, and he came to us with an idea. We had, a, we had the largest country music station in Los Angeles. Um, but it was never going to be a big success because there aren't that many country music fans in L.A. So while it was making money, we thought, you know what, we can do better. Um, our other station was always in the top two or three in the market. So we came up with an idea to pair Rick Dees with the music that people who loved Rick Dees w would listen to. And we put it on the air and it, it, we did all sorts of research and the thing just laid an egg. And Rick was very distraught about it uh, and said, my gosh, uh, I don't know how we did that wrong. And I said, Rick, let me tell you something. Everything that you did and all the analysis we had told us it would work. I said, sometimes it just doesn't. I said, if I were presented with all that data today, I'd make the same decision. If we are a culture that makes rational decisions, we'll, we'll win more than we don't. Uh, and I've always believed that. But sometimes a rational decision turns out to be the wrong one. Um, but I said, you, you cannot beat yourself up. And that, by the way, he, he was so distraught about that, that we sort of waived our normal needling rule, um, you know, about that one. Cause we said, don't needle Rick about that one. Cause this one really drives him crazy. Yeah. But normally if we fail, we tease each other about it, you know, yeah. and, it, and it creates a, it, it culturally, it's just, it, it, it's empowering to everybody. Yeah. That's, that's a, I, I believe in that kind of dynamic as well. And, yeah. um, but I wonder how a public company, you know, whether those groupies you mentioned, how they yeah. how they look at risk taking and failure and and uh, that kind of thing. Does it change when you're yeah. public? When you're right, you're a genius. And when you're wrong, you're an idiot. Same thing. Uh, if your quarterly reports are good, they, they you know, the hardest part is managing in a declining industry because then they just go away. And, and we live with that. And that's why ultimately we transitioned out of it. Um, but we went through two periods where many of my peers went bankrupt. And, you know, the day that uh, about three or four years ago, my CFO came in when we had sold some assets and said, congratulations, this company has paid off a billion, six hundred million dollars of debt and it has no more debt. And when I look at some of my peers who are still uh, r running large radio companies and they're way, way underwater with debt. I say, boy, we're, we're very lucky people. Yeah. And, and, and was that, um, did you get pressure from, from, uh, analysts and, and large well, shareholders? Usually, to... usually, yeah. Usually when you're under leverage, when you're under pressure like that, you're, you, you don't worry about your analysts, you worry about your bankers. Yeah. Um, right. Because when you're, when you're, I mean, we, when we hit, this has always been an industry that, it was highly levered. Uh, that's how you created a great value. Um, and we started the company and uh, you, nobody knows better than your dad. You know, we took a radio station uh, that had, that had, a, I think it was, we paid a million to, we had a million dollar note on it. Um, and so there was, the leverage ratio was astronomical, but the thing made a million dollars in cash flow, I think it's second year. So the leverage ratio is one to one. Most people in the radio industry are levered at 10 to one. So we kept leveraging. And so that's how, you know, an $85,000 investment could be worth, you know, $20, $20 million in four years. Uh, that's, that's when leverage is good. When leverage is bad, I'll give you the other side of that. I've lived both sides of it. Um, in, in um, it, you know, it, at the start of the Great Recession in 09, the company was levered at four times, which is very, very nominal. But when the economy hit the wall, and the cash flows dropped by 65%, the leverage went up to 14%. I mean, 14 times. And mm -hmm. I can tell you, when you are levered at 14 times, you are essentially dead. And only through the, the great work of my people here, we survived that. We got out of it, we delivered the balance sheet, but, and I had a lot of friends who lost their companies. One of the challenges in a time like that is, it used to be if you were over levered, you, you, you tripped a covenant with your bankers uh, and you got a waiver. You paid a fee, you got a waiver. 
But in those days, a lot of a lot of hedge funds were buying debt uh, and they couldn't wait for you to trip a covenant and then they just take over your company. And I, I saw a lot of friends who lost their companies that way. That's probably a lot of boring stuff. Well, I, yeah, I think it's uh, pretty interesting because, uh, you know, instead of, uh, uh, you know, giving the keys back, yeah. you took a look at what your assets were. And, and instead of basically working to service the debt, you ba- instead of working for your banker, yeah, uh, you you had to uh, sell assets and shore up the company and then ha- you you charted a different course. What was that? Right. What, what was that like? That thought process? How did you reach that? Well, new it was course? hard because, you know, I've always said I have a dear friend uh, who was one of my first bankers who has sort of followed my career. And, and he said, I'm here to give you a report card. Um, he said on strategy, a plus on culture, a plus on understanding your businesses, A plus. And he rattled off and he said, on staying too long at the dance, F minus. Um, and I laughed and he said, you should have sold all this stuff because you knew you knew that it was peaking. And uh, I guess I could tell you one great story. Um, Sam Zell, who you probably know of. Sam is a friend. Uh, Sam came to me in the early 2000s and he had a radio company and he said, I want to put it together. Uh, with yours, and I want you to run it, and uh, we'll, we'll be the biggest company in the industry. And I said, Sam, um, I, you know what? I, if I wanted to make the most money, I would do this because I know that in two years you're going to come to me and say this industry has peaked. And I knew it was going to peak because I knew all the pluses and minuses. And and we'll sell and we'll make a lot of money, and then we'll go buy widget factories. Um, And I said, but I love what I do. I love my culture. um, And I'm willing to live with this. And that was probably one of the single stupidest statements of all time, because lo and behold, Sam bought some other stuff, sold it two years later, made a gazillion dollars and went on about widget factories. Now, the problem with Sam is he bought the Chicago Tribune and that went bankrupt. So we we all make mistakes. But I loved what I did and I was willing to live with it. And I and and then finally, after a number of years, I said, look, I, I still love it but it is time to transition out of it. And now we're looking at other things and, and having a lot of fun. We bought some new businesses, looking at other things, um, and, and, and it's fun. Um, I'm really curious to hear, uh, I feel like people often have this strong preference between like a, a like a public company versus a private company, like who they right. want to work for, um, what type right. of um, business they want to be in. Um, I'm I, curious to kind of hear your pitch for the uh, the public company. What what what? A, a, a public company is great if you're in a business that is growing, um, because it allows you to have access to capital. You can use your stock for acquisitions. You can use your stock to reward your employees. Uh, you can pay dividends, um, and as the stock rises, it creates tremendous value. Probably the greatest time I ever had when our stock was rising, when employees would come to me and said, you know, uh, my stock options bought bought a home for my parents when they were retiring. My, our, my stock options uh, put my kids through college. I, I don't think anything's ever been as gratifying to me as that. Um, so all of that. But the downside of a public company is when when you're in a sector which is unloved, it's not a lot of fun. We delisted our company a couple of years ago because we said, look, we're spending two million dollars a year filing federal, you know, the SEC reports uh, and there's just no buyers for the stock. So that that's, you know, it, it so it, it depends. A public company gives you access to capital and in a, in a not in a growing industry, it is tremendously valuable. Um, there are constraints, you know, Sarbanes-Oxley, there's all sorts of expenses. So those are expenses you gladly incur when things are growing. When they're not growing, it's just expense you shouldn't have. You have a preference. Do you like one over the other, understanding the, the pros and cons? Or is it, it, it depends some on the day, Greg. When business is good, you want to be public. When business is lousy, don't be public. Mm-hmm. So is there a difference in your mind between – uh, is culturally between public and private companies if you don't care about short-term stock performance and if you don't care about how there, how how mean the analysts are yeah i think i think culturally i think you always have to keep sight of the enterprise and keep sight you, you're only as good as your people are uh, and i don't care whether you're public or private you got to take care of them um you know we 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 that, that was the first thing i did when i took control of the company give 
ownership to some of my people. Uh, I couldn't, I can't stress it enough. Wonderful. Is there anything you'd like uh, our listeners to, to know about? The people who listen to this podcast are trying to improve the company culture of their, of their small or medium sized business. I think the most important thing again, um, is, you know, like I said, we, we did the 10 commandments of MS. I've, I've discussed them in speeches for 30 years. I can't tell you how many people come up and said, can you send me those values? I love your values. And I said, I'll send them to you, but the values of the company have to be your values. If you don't live up to the values that you expound to your people, it, 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 you lose all credibility. Uh, that's not to say, have we always done everything right? Of course we haven't, but everybody in this company knows that the funding, the founding principles of this company are how we're going to run it. Uh, and by golly, we're going to try. Um, and if, and if you pick your core values, pick what's most important to you, you know, ours is, you know, you know, have fun, be rational, never jeopardize your, your, your you know, your integrity, admit your mistakes. Uh, a whole host of things like that. Those are what matter to us. And, you know, and hopefully we live up to those every day. Yeah. Um, I've, I've also said one of the biggest challenges in a, in a, in a, in a downturn in a, in an industry that's down, and I'll give you this example. I used to say when we were in a growing industry, we used to say um, there's a hill over there and we're going to take that hill. And here's the plan, and here's here's how we're going to take the hill, and we take the hill. When you're in a, de a declining industry and things are bad, the biggest challenge I had, and I've told my managers this, which is why we had to transition the company. When you're in a declining industry, those same people look at the hill, and they go, there's a boulder on that hill that's going to roll down and kill me. Um, and you got to change that mindset. So you, you just got to you got to look at different hills. And I think that that's why we transitioned the company five years ago. Thank you so much, Jeff. Um, the reason why I love to, to do this podcast is because um, we get to talk to so many business leaders who really do care about culture and put so much energy into thinking about this and caring for their people. Mm -hmm. um, I love to hear your perspective on that. So thank you so much for coming on the show. And hopefully we can talk to you um, again sometime. Anytime. Caroline, it's been fun. Greg, always good seeing you. You too, Jeff. Always, always a wonderful time to be with you. Take care. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Well, that was uh, really fun. And not only uh, because we learned a lot about how a public company might impact culture, but just Jeff's story and his adventures were really neat. Um, you know, he, he's a, through and through, he's a broadcasting junkie. And, uh, and it seemed like as a kid, he knew what he wanted to do, and, and he's he stuck with it since. I loved his story by the just just by the way about how he he bought a uh, radio station in Hungary and then it was nationalized and it, it's you know it just seems like something you'd read about in a book yet yet here he was having his his news his uh, radio station nationalized by the by the Hungarian government that, that currently he's in power too fascinating story well yeah first I mean I've never felt like more of a of a podcasting amateur than, than when we talked to Jeff. Right. Um, he was so kind, but you could just tell he knew very much what he was doing. And I'm over here still figuring it out. Um, so that was fun. But yeah, I mean, he I feel like every story he um, he shared with us, it was one of those things like you, you can't make this up. You literally can't make this up. Again, it's something you think about like reading in a book. And it was so cool to be talking to this um this person who's experienced all these things. Yeah. And so, you know, he started a, a company and developed a cultural philosophy then. So maybe we'll just, you know, start about lay that groundwork, you know, and, which I just loved, you know, uh, be good to your people was the first thing he said. And of yep. course, that's just absolutely what we are trying to do. Um, I always also liked how collaborative uh, his decision-making process was, you know, the, the idea that, uh, um, you know, you can't lead where others won't follow. And, and so you need to, you know, have that safe space. And we've talked about in, in so many of our episodes, the concept of psychological safety has come up so that, so that the people who work for you can tell you the boss, Hey, your idea, not great. And yeah, I think that's a huge. He definitely did not seem like the person to surround himself with. Yes. People. Uh, I think, I think he wanted to to hear what people really thought, or I should say, wants to hear what people really thought, think. And um, 
also he's somebody who owns his failures, which again, something, a recurring topic um, on this podcast, the importance of having that leader willing, willing to own his failures and willing to, to maybe be made fun of a little bit for them. Um, when, when you, when you lead the charge on something that maybe doesn't go so well. Yeah. Like the, uh, out of the gate, the all sports radio story was fun. And yeah. This is, this stuck with me that when he said culture allows you to survive bad times. Yeah. Wow. That's fascinating. You know, because when there are good times, you know, everything's going well and, you know, rising tide industry and, and, uh, you know, when things turn like they did for the, the radio business globally, a lot of his competitors went out of business and he, he uh, ascribed his success, his ability to stay in business uh, to his culture. And, uh, and then he developed these, these uh, uh, commandments, he calls them, the, uh, on the website. If you go to emmis.com under About Us, you can find the 11 commandments of Emmis. And uh, they're really fun to look at. And they all make sense. And when you put them down, then you can really, on paper, you can really say, okay, th- this, is, this is really, this, this, this is not a set of values. It's almost a set of behaviors. You know, admit your mistakes, have, admit your mistakes, have fun, be good to your people, th- those kinds of things. So I'd encourage the listeners to go to that uh, website, ms.com under About Us and check those out. Yeah, two things that I thought were great about that. One, Jeff was able to rattle those off so easily. Yeah. And that may seem like a small thing, but to your point, Greg, you know, I could tell you Archimedes values. They also spell out Archimedes, so I can kind of cheat there. And they're <laughs> one they're one word. Whereas these, they're eleven values, they're they're more like phrases and behaviors. And while I'm sure Jeff had a big hand in in putting them together, it, it says something that he they really they really mean something to him and, and he more than likely lives them every day. Um, and, and he just holds them that closely that he, he can rattle them off. Um, the second thing was, you know, we did, we, we talked to him about, you know, taking his company public and, and the impacts that that had. And I kind of, I got the impression it, it didn't have too much of an impact on his culture because he didn't let it, you know, he said, this is the company we've, we've built this amazing culture. We've spent all this time fostering it. I'm going to take the company public because that's what we we need to do now. That's what makes sense. But that doesn't mean that that we need to start responding to public pressure on things. Yeah. He said, look, uh, when when the industry was growing, uh, going public gave him the uh, access to capital that he needed to, to execute on his his plans. Uh, but the the short term nature of, of, of public investors, you know, they want 90 day increments of success. That sounds miserable to me. Absolutely. I mean, I, I'm the queen of setting some really tight timeline because I think that if I can do something and do it really quickly, isn't that even better than, than if it had taken me a year to do it. And then it ends up taking me a year because 90 days just isn't long enough to, to get what really needs to be done, done most of the times. So I think him, he really seems like he sticks sticks to his guns, stick to, sticks to his morals and, and protects um, his employees and his company when it comes to that, even if sometimes, you know, the public might not be super happy with him. And I think he mentioned, you know, their their share price has dropped based on decisions and then it comes back up. You know, he's like, it's, it's going to be cyclical and, and we're just going to do what's best for the company and, and the employees. Yeah. And uh, the bottom line, as you referenced just a few minutes ago, there's really no difference between public and private companies from a culture perspective. If you don't care about the short-term stock performance and or you don't care about the the feedback from the analysts, if you just keep focused on your people um, or whatever your your commandments are as an organization, then there really is very little difference other than maybe you know dealing with the, the regulatory issues as a pain in the butt. But other than that, there really isn't one. And that's one thing I learned today. Yeah, and I'm glad he had that outlook. I know um, Kitty shared a story where she didn't have as great of an experience and felt like there was a lot of pressure on on meeting certain standards um, based on on you know satisfying the public so so they could have access to all the capital that they needed. Um, and I think that that the way that Jeff looks at things um, is certainly more um, certainly more conducive to having a healthy culture and 
And again, culture is what gets you through the bad times. So um, I would argue that's the most important thing. Yeah, I agree. In our next episode, we will continue our series, um, but this time we'll be talking about family-owned businesses. What happens when family dynamics come into the workplace? We will be joined by the chairman and CEO of Walker, Steve Walker, and um, this is a this is a company that's um, been in his family for a couple generations now. So I'm excited to hear what he has to say. Mm-hmm.